open your Bibles, if you have them this morning, to Acts chapter 11. Acts chapter 11 is where we are going to be this morning, and so excited about the passage of Scripture that we are going to be in. If you are new here, or this is the first time you have been here, or maybe last week was your first time, we have been in a study walking through the book of Acts, chapter by chapter, verse by verse, through the book of Acts. And we are on our 15th week in the study of the book of Acts, and we are in chapter 11. Acts is referred to by many as the Acts of the Apostles. The Acts of the Apostles. Luke, the author of the book of Acts, also wrote the Gospel of Luke. And in the Gospel of Luke, he wrote about the things that Jesus did. And then Acts is him writing about the things that the apostles did after Jesus ascended into heaven. Jesus ascends into heaven in Acts chapter 1. And the rest of the book is what the disciples, the apostles, those who saw the resurrected Savior, did after Jesus has left the scene. And so we're following this story of the early church. Jesus lived a perfect 33 years on this earth. He died on the cross for the sins of the world. We just sang about it. He rose from the grave on the third day. And then he appeared to, the scripture says, many witnesses. For 40 days, Jesus appeared to witnesses, 500 of them at one time. And don't lose sight of that because that's a real big deal. Because when you see someone crucified, killed, and buried, and then you have breakfast with them on the side of the sea, like that's going to do something to you. And it does something to these men and these women. And many of them were martyred saying that they saw the risen Savior. They were killed. They were saying, you tell us you didn't see Jesus or die. And they were like, well, I can't help but talk about what I saw. You can't make me tell you something that didn't happen. I saw the resurrected Savior, and they were crucified. They were were martyred, many of the men that we're talking about in the book of Acts. So before Jesus ascends into heaven, he says this in Acts chapter 1, verse 8. He says this, you shall receive power... When the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. So Jesus said, here's what you're going to do. Jesus is like, I have to leave. In the Gospels, Jesus says what? It's better for me to go that the Holy Spirit will come and dwell within you, and then you're going to be my witnesses. And he says, you're going to be witnesses to me in all these different places, Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, to the, to the end of the earth. And then what we've already seen is it's starting to happen. The Holy Spirit empowers them. These, some of these men that were cowards and running when Jesus was crucified are now emboldened by the power of the Spirit and the resurrected Savior, and they are doing exactly what Jesus said they would do, and thousands of people are putting their faith and trust in Christ. Thousands of people were reading about in Acts, but anytime you're doing something good for the kingdom of God, everyone's not happy. So in that, there's problems. There's problems inside the church. There's problems outside the church. The apostles are beaten. Stephen is is Martyr. The gospel goes to Samaria. It is, it is spreading like wildfire, but don't miss this in the book of Acts. It's so important for us. It's not because they were so special. Acts chapter 4, verse 12 says, when they saw the boldness of Peter and John, they perceived that they were uneducated and untrained men. That's Acts 4, verse 12. It says they marveled and they realized that they had been with Jesus. Put that verse on the screen for me real quick, Mark. It says, when they saw the boldness of Peter and John, they perceived that they were uneducated and untrained men, and they marveled, and they realized that they had been with Jesus. And that's a great testimony, isn't it? I mean, there was something. they, They said, I don't know what it is about these guys. They're not that smart. They don't have it all figured out. We, these guys are fishermen and tax. These are a bunch of, again, Grant Styles version, yahoos. These are just some guys, some regular dudes. But they had been with Jesus, and that changed everything. And these men with power and boldness, God began to use. Two weeks ago, I told you there's three, really four, if you want to add um, the martyrdom of Stephen in it, but three main events in the book of Acts, I believe. And it's Pentecost, when the Holy Spirit comes upon the believers in Acts chapter 2. It's the conversion of Saul in Acts chapter 9. And then two weeks ago, we looked at the conversion of Cornelius. And that's one of the key events to the book of Acts, because it's really going to set the trajectory for the book of Acts the rest of the time that we're we're going to read, this conversion of Cornelius. And why? Cornelius is a Roman centurion, and he was a Gentile. Now, remember, when we hear the word Gentile in Scripture, it means non-Jewish person. So most of you in this room are are Gentiles in the room. I'm a Gentile in the room. I'm a non-Jewish person. And so the gospel is going to go to the non-Jewish people. And I say praise God for that, because that means the gospel has come to me and it's come to you. 
So the gospel comes to this Roman centurion, and it comes through Peter. I mean, of all the people who are going to be bold and big, and you don't really want to argue with someone, it's going to be Peter. And so God calls Peter and gives him this vision and says, Peter, I want you to go down to this town, and I want you to talk to this man named Cornelius. At Acts chapter 10, verse 44, it says, while Peter was still speaking these words, Peter goes down and meets with this guy, Cornelius. He brings some witnesses with him. And it says, while Peter was still speaking these words, the Holy Spirit fell upon all those who heard the word. And those of the circumcision who believed were astonished as many as came with Peter because the gift of the Holy Spirit had been poured out to the Gentiles also. So again, I got to give some preview to where we're going to be today. Peter goes down and he brings these Jewish guys with him. He's like, I don't know what I'm going to do down here. If you remember, we read last week, but he shows up, two weeks ago rather, he shows up and the Holy Spirit comes upon these non-Jews, these Gentiles. And the Jewish people are there like, what just happened? Are you serious? This just happened? To the Gentiles, the same Holy Spirit that we got back at Pentecost is now came upon the Gentiles. And so this morning, we're going to be in Acts chapter 11. We're going to look at 18 verses. But I want us to pray before we do today, because there's a number of important things for us in this passage today. Would you bow your heads with me and pray this morning? We're going to pray two simple prayers this morning. I want you to pray these prayers if you're watching online. Would you just pray this simple prayer this morning? Lord, speak to me. Could that just be your prayer? This morning, Lord, speak to me. And then secondly, would you just pray, Lord, speak through Grant this morning? Because this week, like every chance I get to preach, I don't have anything to offer if God doesn't give me the words. So would you just pray online and in the house, Lord, speak through Grant this morning. Father, the posture of our heart, as always, is we just want to hear from you. Lord, it's why we're here. That's why we sung praises to you, because you're worthy of the praise, and Lord, we want to hear from you, Lord. So we're claiming the promise that your word never returns void this morning. So God, help us to eliminate distractions of what we have brought in or what we might walk out into, but Lord, for the next few moments, help us to be attentive to your word. And Lord, I pray you would use me this morning, in spite of me, use me this morning as we open your word, Lord. We know it is powerful and sharp, so God, use it this morning in Jesus' name. And everyone said, amen. Amen. Acts chapter 11, Peter has had this unreal exchange with the Gentiles, this this vision with God. But if you're taking notes, I want you to write this down. We're going to seek controversy. We're going to seek controversy. Man, things are going great. People are getting saved. People are excited. I mean, you think it would be, let's go, let's go. I heard a pastor once tell me that more people that climb Mount Everest die on the descent than they do on the ascent. And I looked it up and I saw it on the internet, so it has to be true. But, but, but he, said, he said more people die, watch this, when they're, when they're leaving Everest than they do when they're climbing up Everest. And there's a couple different reasons that that happens. They say on the backside there's some, there's some more challenges because of some weather. But what happens a lot of times is people can let their guard down when they've accomplished something big. Like you take a deep breath. And sometimes what will happen in your life and my life is, man, we will have a victory for the Lord. We will make a decision. Or you'll say, I'm serious. Starting today, I'm not going to do this anymore, or I'm not going to do that anymore, or I'm making a change in my life. And you'll say, this is what I'm going to do. And you're excited, and we're on this mountaintop. And then what happens after that, man, the enemy comes right after us. And he wants to discourage, and he wants to steal away a decision that you've made, and he wants you to question Something that happened, man, I'm just going to tell you what, I'm going to be praising God for what happened last week for the next number of months. I'm going to be praising God. I'm going to look back. That was a special Sunday we had last Sunday. Not just because someone else preached. Somebody said, amen. But I'm just saying, that was was a special Sunday that last Sunday. Man, I think just God moved in so many testimonies and stories that we've heard. And and so, man, when something like that happens, man, I don't take a deep breath and exhale. I get my guard up because I'm watching because I know how the enemy works. Peter goes to this house. God uses him. These, these people get saved. And watch what happens. Verse 1 of Acts 11. Now the apostles and brethren who were in Judea heard that the Gentiles also received the word of God. Now here's where it should say, and they were so excited, and they were happy, and they were praising God that the Gentiles also got saved. I mean, that's what should happen. But what happens, verse 2, when Peter came to Jerusalem, those of the circumcision, the Jewish believers, contended with him saying, you went into the uncircumcised men and ate with them? I mean, people just got saved. Peter had a vision. God moved in a great way. And Peter comes into Jerusalem. These guys are like, who'd you have dinner with, Peter? I saw on your social media account, it looked like you were hanging out. 
Some people that weren't Jewish. Who'd you eat with? What'd you have for dinner, Peter? I wonder. Like these guys are mad. It says they contended with them. Now, for us today, we can look at that and say, I mean, what's the big deal? I mean, he just ate with somebody. But in Jewish, Jewish culture, the Jewish people were, still are, God's chosen people. And so they are called, watch this, to be set apart. And part of them being set apart to them and their culture and where they are is, I'm not going to eat with someone that's not Jewish. I'm not going to fellowship with them. I'm not going to put myself in position and come under their household. They don't believe like we are. They don't worship the same God that we worship. So I'm not going to put myself in that position. So in customs and traditions, you don't eat with non-Jews. But what has happened? Jesus has said what? God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, the scripture says. Jesus has come and said that, that you are to go to all the world and preach the gospel and salvation, that it is for all. So Christ has now come, this era of grace, this era of inclusivity, and in that everyone is invited to come to the kingdom and come to the feast, Jews and non-Jews alike. Everyone is invited. And so what happens is a miracle takes place. A whole family accepts Christ. If you remember two weeks ago in the end of Acts chapter 10, like, like Cornelius invited everyone. There's like a packed house in there listening to the words that Peter said, and the Holy Spirit came upon them, and they put their faith and trust in Christ. And yet these people are worried about what Peter was eating and who he was eating it with. You ever met someone that majored on the minors? You know what I'm talking about? They're always mad about something. You're always going to find something to be mad about. Friend, you can always find something to be mad about. Amen? Amen? We can always find something to be mad about. Some of you have the spiritual gift of finding something to be mad about. That's what your spiritual gift is. You're like, no, the Lord has just given me discernment. No, no, you're, you're negative, all right? That ain't discernment, all right? You're just a negative person. I mean, these guys are looking for something. Listen, I, I want to I wanna, I wanna make sure that I'm cautious when I'm reading Scripture, that I'm not like, can you believe they did that? And then I look at the last week of my life, and I do the same thing in different ways. Now, I ain't mad about somebody eating with somebody else, but I can sometimes get fired up about dumb stuff. Why, am I, why do I care about that? In the scope of everything, does that change eternity? Is it really that big of a deal? And it honestly hinders a lot of churches. I praise God for our church. I praise God for preacher's leadership for all those years. And just you, you and the church family that have been here for so many times, we are not a church that gets all fired up about the minors, and I praise God for that. I hope we never will be. But you know, chump churches, it just cripples them because they spend their whole time focusing on the minors. The things that just don't matter. I mean, that's what these people are. They're getting mixed up. They were stuck in traditions. They were stuck in how they've always done it. But watch what Peter does, verse 4. It says, but Peter explained it to them in order from the beginning, saying, Peter's like, hey, 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 let me just tell you what happened. Let me just explain it to you. He says, five, five, I was in the city of Joppa praying, and in a trance I saw a vision an object descending like a great sheet, let down from heaven by four corners, and it came to me. When I observed it, I intently, and I can, when I observed it intently, rather, and considered, I saw four-footed animals of the earth, wild beasts, creeping things, birds of the air, and I heard a voice from saying to me, rise, Peter, kill, and eat. So Peter's like, I was in a trance, Remember, he was praying and he was hungry. Remember we saw a couple weeks ago? And he's in this trance, and all of a sudden he has this vision of the sheep coming down with all these animals, clean animals and unclean animals. What that means is animals the Jewish people could eat and the animals the Jewish people could not eat. He has this dream, and then what happens? He hears a voice say, rise, Peter, kill and eat, verse 8. But I said, not so, Lord, for nothing common or unclean has at any time entered my mouth. Peter's like, I had this vision, and I was like, Lord, no, I'm not going to do it. I've never had anything unclean touch my mouth. Nine, but the voice answered me again from heaven, what God has cleansed, you must not call common. Peter said, man, I had this vision, and in this vision, the sheet comes down, and there's animals on there, and they're like, rise and eat, and I'm like, nah, I'm not going to eat because I've never eaten anything like that before, but he says, you're not able to call, you're not able to see something that's unclean that I am calling clean. Peter is telling them this, the story, and it's really interesting to us. We have to remember this when we see in Scripture, when you're reading it like we're reading it um, um, through um, consecutively, this is the third time this story has been told in a chapter and a half. If God says it three times, it's not by accident. This is significant. 
I mean, three different times. I mean, it happens, then Peter recounts the story, and now Peter's recounting the story to Gay. There's some significance in here. God makes no mistakes. Three times is, is importance about what's being said, that the gospel is coming to the Gentiles. And Luke wants the readers of the book of Acts to know this is real, and this happened, and I want you to see that it happened. And hey, just in case you missed it, I want you to see it happened again, that the gospel has come to the Gentiles. Peter's answering the critics. Why was he in the house with the Gentiles? Why was he eating? He said, man, I'm, I was just doing what God instructed me to do. Write this down, number two, the command. So there's controversy. And Peter's like, but man, there was a command. God says in verse 9 of Acts 11, the voice answered me from heaven, what God has cleansed, you must not call common. And what was God saying? God, God was teaching Peter and the church, watch this, that these old distinctions of what is clean and what is unclean no longer apply in Christ. These old ways, common and uncommon, food, these, he goes, that, that's not how it is anymore because Christ has come. And who are you to call something unclean that I have called clean? So this vision of the sheets really wasn't about animals and what you can have for dinner tonight. This really, it's what it's really about. It's not really just about kosher and non-kosher food. What he was saying in this vision, this trance to Peter was, it was about people. It was about people. It was about, about in this trance, Peter getting the vision that the gospel is for everyone, that the gospel's for everyone. And then he's going to prove and show through the miraculous tongues here in a minute that this came upon the Gentiles as well. Verse 10. Now, this was done three times, and all were drawn up into heaven. How many times have we heard the story? Three times. How many times did he get the vision? Three times. Three like seven. Many times in Scripture we see is this idea of completeness. We see it three times. Three times. At the very moment, how many men? Three men. I'm jumping there. But three men stood before the house where I was, and having been sent to me from Caesarea, remember, while this is happening at the same time, there's a vision happening from Cornelius and Caesarea to send some men down to Joppa. It says, the Spirit told me to go with them, doubting nothing. Moreover, these six brethren accompanied me. Peter's like, I took witnesses. So, just so you know, I wasn't there by myself. I took some witnesses with me. He says, we entered the man's house, and he told us how he had seen an angel standing in his house who said to him, send men to Joppa and call for Simon, whose surname is Peter who will tell you the words by which you and all your household will be saved. Number three, the commission. The command, he says, hey, what God has cleansed, you must not call common. And then there's this commission. He says, I want you to go from Joppa to, to Caesarea. Again, this is a place where the Jews really wouldn't have wanted to travel. It really is Caesarea, this sort of Roman capital in the Israeli empire there on the coast. Beautiful city. If you go and look at what this city would have looked like in this time and, and, and the architecture and what they had, the city is still there, but a lot of these buildings are torn down. But if you want to go look, it's just a really neat thing to go look at and to study. It's actually just amazing. But a lot of Jews didn't want to go there. I mean, it's Romans on Romans on Romans, and they wouldn't have wanted to be there. And yet Peter goes there, doubting nothing. It says he, he goes from Joppa to Caesarea, a Roman area, verse 12. Then the Spirit told me to go with them, doubting nothing. Nothing. Some versions say the Spirit told me to have no hesitation about going with them. Listen, God's mission is a Holy Spirit-led one. God's mission is a Holy Spirit-led one. It is his Spirit that aligns with God's Word. R remember in Acts, we're going to see this over and over again. We've already seen it. We'll continue to see it. That the Christian faith is an active faith. The Christian faith is a moving faith. It is an obeying faith. Throughout Acts, we're going to see God stirring in the hearts of his people to go, move, say yes, do this. God has never called you and me to come and sit in a pew for 2.3 Sundays a month for 50 years of our life and then go enjoy our heavenly reward. It's not what he's called us to do. He's got something for me. He's got something for you. Are we looking for it? Are we being obeying to the Holy Spirit in our life? Are we saying yes when he calls? They're not just gathering together saying, bless me if you can. They're open-handedly saying, God, what do you have? And the envelope and their faith is being pushed time and time again. Again, to us, this is not that big of a deal. Maybe for you in this room, because you've read it many times, or maybe from you, it's like, bro, what's the big deal? Jew going to hang out with Gentile. Friend, it is a big deal. It's a big deal what's happening here. It's a huge deal. 
It's why it's said three times. It's why these people are beefing it out with Peter. Because this is a big deal, what is happening here. Because this is going to change the trajectory of the book of Acts and change the trajectory of the world for the gospel's sake. It's going to change the trajectory of the world. That here, this little area in Israel, that that little area in Israel is going to be the gospel message that is going to go around the world and shape the Christian faith and the church through the power of Christ's sacrifice on the cross and the power of the Holy Spirit. Again, here we are in Raleigh all these years later talking about it. It's a big deal. A Gentile up here looking at God's word. So number four, this is important. We see the confirmation. The confirmation. Again, these guys are criticizing Peter. He's recounting the story. And here's the kicker. Peter's like, I went down. And they're like, tell us about God. So I did. Verse 15. As I began to speak, the Holy Spirit fell upon them as upon us at the beginning. So this, what does he say? He says, the Holy Spirit fell upon us. And how did it fall upon them, rather? He said it fell upon them. How, how, did, how did it fall upon them? He says, as it did us at the beginning. Well, the beginning is Acts chapter 2, verse 4. Write that reference on. It's on the screen. It says they were filled. This is when the Holy Spirit came upon the Jewish believers. It says they were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. So Peter's like, remember what happened to us in Acts chapter 2? He didn't say Acts chapter 2. He would have just said what happened to us, right? He says, remember what happened to us? The same exact thing happened to them. The Holy Spirit fell, and they were dwelling in Jerusalem, Jews, verse 5, devout men from every nation under heaven. And when this sound occurred, the multitude came together and were confused because everyone heard them speak in his own language. And they were amazed and marveled, saying one to another, look, are not all these who speak Galileans? And how is it that we hear each in our own language in which we were born? So watch this. How did the Holy Spirit come in Pentecost? The Holy Spirit fell upon these Jewish believers, and they began to praise God in languages that they did not speak, so other people understood those languages. It wasn't a heavenly language. It wasn't a language that no one understood. It was a language that someone that spoke Spanish, <clears throat> excuse me, someone that spoke Spanish was like, how are they praising God in Spanish when they don't know Spanish? Again, it wasn't Spanish. But you understand what I'm saying? That's what happened. They were speaking in other languages. And Peter's like, remember how it happened to us? The same exact thing happened to them. The Holy Spirit fell, and they began to speak. And again, this is proof. The power of the Holy Spirit and this gift of tongues in Acts, where you're seeing, is just showing proof that God had truly saved them. Because if he just came back and was like, man, these Gentiles got saved. I mean, they all raised their hand for salvation and said they want to get baptized. The Jews would be like, really? Did they really? But he said, no, no, no. The Holy Spirit came upon them, just like it did with us. And they were praising God. I mean, God, God was working. This is parallel to Pentecost, Pentecost with the Jewish believers, and now it's with the Gentiles in Cornelius' house. And Peter says, verse 15, I began to speak. The Holy Spirit fell upon them as us in the beginning. And this next verse is so important for us today. I want you to highlight this verse. So important. The first seven words of this verse, verse 16. Watch what it says. He says, then I remembered the word of the Lord. I counted those before I preached so I could say the right number. Then I remembered the word of the Lord. This is really important for us in our faith, what's happening in this text right here. Again, Jew-Gentile thing, hard for us to relate to, but there's a lot of feelings involved. There's a lot of emotion involved. There's history. There's cultural norms there is pressure from the outside of you can't eat with them, you can't talk with them, discrimination, racism prevalent in these areas between Jews and Samaritans, Jews and Gentiles, Gentiles and Jews, Samaritans and Jews. There's just all this kind of strife and everything going around. It's hard for us to get our mind around. But what wins out? The Spirit's leading and the Word of God. Peter says, I was reminded of the word of God. I'll read the rest of the verse in a second. Peter is aligning himself. Friend, listen, this is important for all of us in the room. We have to align ourselves and our lives with the word of God. It's the Spirit's leading and the word of God. But watch this. Both need to line up. The Spirit's never going to lead you somewhere that the word doesn't say what it says. That's important for you to know. There's a lot of people that talk about how the Spirit led and the Spirit this. And if the Spirit don't lead and line up with this, then that ain't the Spirit, friend, or it ain't the Spirit you want to be following. It's important for you to know that. The Holy Spirit will never lead against what God's Word says. Write that down. 
The, the, the Holy Spirit will never lead against what God's word says. They're always going to line up. And this is why it's so important that we know God's word. That we know God's word. Spoiler, I'm really excited. It's a long ways off, but I'm super excited about something we're going to do in January as a church family this year, um, together this year. I'm, I'm super pumped about it. That's all I can say. But, but back to this. It's why it's so important that we know God's word. Because if I don't know God's word, I can very easily be swayed by my own feelings, emotions, what's going on around me, and then the Lord this and the Lord that. But when I know God's word and I have the power of the spirit, then I'm able to walk in truth. Does that make sense? So we want to know what the word of God says. And then I'm going to follow the Spirit's leading, but it's always going to line up with the Word of God. We have to know this. And so Peter's like, all these things are going on. And then he says in 16, I remembered the Word of the Lord. How he said, John indeed baptized with water, but you shall be baptized with the Holy Spirit. Right? The reference now, Mark 1.8. Peter's like, all this is going on. I'm thinking, what does this mean? And he goes, I remember the word of the Lord. He says, I remember what John said. I remember that, 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 that John was going to baptize with the Spirit is going to come later. John baptized, but the Spirit was going to come later to those that have trusted. And now the Spirit has come upon the Gentiles. He said, I remember the word of the Lord. So the Holy Spirit's baptism falling on them was confirmation to the Jews. We see it every time in Acts when the Holy Spirit comes. But confirmation to the Jews that they truly were saved. That they truly put their faith and trust in Christ. 17. If therefore God gave them the same gift he gave us when we believed on the Lord Jesus Christ, who was I that I could withstand God? Peter's like, they had the same exact thing happened to them. I'm, how, how am I going to fight against that? Same spirit that came on me. Same spirit that came on you. At Pentecost happened to them. How am I going to withstand that? How can I fight against that? He's like setting personal feelings aside. Setting personal preferences aside. Peter's like, how can I withstand God, his word, the spirit moving? 18. When they heard these things, they became silent. Can you imagine that? These Jews, the Holy Spirit did what? Like us? Can you imagine them looking around that room? Because this changes everything for them. Changes everything for them. The Bible says they're stunned. It says, and they glorified God, saying, then God has also granted to the Gentiles repentance to life. They're stunned. They can't believe it. I I imagine, I don't know if this is what happens, but this is how I imagine. I imagine they are stunned, and like one person was like, and then like, you know that time where like one person like claps, you don't know, and then like all of a sudden the whole, I just think that's kind of thing is what happened. It was like one person clapped, and then can we just try, that's going to be fun right here. I'll clap, and then like somebody clap over here and here, we'll all clap just for fun. We'll remember this moment. Are you ready? One person was like. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. All right, yeah. Some of y'all aren't happy the Gentiles got the gospel. But anyway, you understand the point. You, you see what happened. I mean, they're all like, can you believe this? Man, truly the gospel has come to the Gentiles for repentance to life. And then what does it say? They glorified God. They go from criticizing to praising, from complaining to glorifying a pastor, uh, a preacher said this a long time ago. I I can't remember if preacher told this person this or someone told this to preacher or preacher was in a meeting where somebody told it, but here's what was said. Church was having a hard time. They were having all this issue and they said, pray that God helps you win some people to Christ because when you win some people to Christ, all the other problems go away. He said, just pray that God will save some people in the church because when you start getting some people to put their faith and trust in Christ, all of a sudden a lot of little, you don't really care as much about the carpet color when people are getting saved. When your grandson gets saved, or your daughter gets saved, or your uncle gets saved, or your aunt gets saved, or a change happens in the life of the kid that you've been praying for, for all these years happens, all of a sudden, you don't really care how loud the music is. You don't really care about what someone's wearing. You don't really care about this situation. All of a sudden, you realize, hey, those things really aren't that important anymore, and I'm going to praise God and glorify God. That's what happens in this passage of Scripture. They go from criticizing Peter, who you eating with, bro, to, are you kidding me? Praise God. And they're excited about what God is doing. And what it does for us, it shows us God's heart for all people and that the gospel breaks down barriers of race, 
culture and tradition. Doesn't matter where you're from. Doesn't matter who you are. Christ comes to save. And he'll save anybody who says yes to him. And this is the power of the gospel. And we're going to see it in the book of Acts because the gospel is going to shift from Jerusalem. It's going to take a big shift and the gospel is going to go to the Gentiles. And Saul is going to take the gospel to the Gentiles. And we're going to see God move in an amazing way. Here we go. Act on Acts. Some things to consider as we move forward. Number one, what barrier is there in your life that is stopping you from being used by God? I want us to consider a few things this morning before I pray. What barrier is there in your life that is stopping you from being used by God? For the Jews, it was traditions of men. It was honestly discrimination against the Gentiles. It was a narrow view of what God was doing. But what about you? What are the lies in your life that are keeping you from believing God wants to use you? What is that barrier in your life? What is that, what is that thing in your life? That might be keeping you because there was a barrier there for the Jewish people and God broke down that barrier through the power of the gospel in Cornelius' house and the Holy Spirit falling upon them. But what is it for you? What's the barrier stopping you? Number two, write this down. It's a big one. What area of your life do you value your own opinion too greatly? What area of your life do you value your own opinion too greatly? Greatly. Proverbs 14, 12 says, there's a way that seems right unto man. There's a way that seems right to man, but the end is the way of death. You can write that reference now. Proverbs 14, 12. There's a way that seems right to man. My emotions, my feelings, it makes sense. This is right. But the Bible says the end of it is death. And if we're not careful, watch this, we can elevate our view and our opinion and diminish God's. We can elevate our opinions and our views and, and diminish God's. And I think that's one of the greatest problems in the American church is that we value our opinions too much. We put our opinions here and we put other people's opinions, but not only that, the word of God and the spirit of God beneath what our opinions are. And I think it's a disease that has spread from the American culture. Everybody do what you want to do. Do what you want to do, as long as it doesn't bother me, but just do what you want to do, whatever you feel, however you feel. Everyone feel, 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 feel. If you feel this, then do it. It's this whole culture that we've seen for years and years and years. We value our opinion above God's leading and above God's word, and it's always been an issue. It's not a new thing. I mean, go back and read the book of Judges. What do we see in the book of Judges? It says this, every man did that which was right in his own eyes. So it's our sin nature that pulls us to think Grant's opinion is the most important opinion. And I know best. And some of you are like, I would never do that, Grant. Really? Really? Where do we put our opinions? Do do we value them above what God's word says? Do we value them above what the spirit is leading? And so here's what happens. We justify sin. I mean, mean, we're living together, but it's 2024. It's just not that idea of value, our opinion over what God's word says, alcohol abuse. But what we allow ourselves to watch and to listen to, man, I just need a break. It's not that big of a deal. I'm not like I'm 14 years old. This doesn't really matter what I put in front of my, my eyes, but it matters. Stuff that promotes sin. We value our opinion over what God's word says, that we should strive for holiness. God's word is clear. We are to be set apart, and we're not many times. We, we, we play with sin, and it eats our lunch because we value our opinion. We value what our thoughts are. We minimize Sin, and you can go through anything, pornography, gossip, homosexuality, instead of aligning ourselves with God's word, it's how do you feel? How do you feel? And if you if you're feel that way, then man, just do it. it. It's this idea and this mantra of every, 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 if we're not careful, every romance novel, follow your heart. Just follow your heart. The, my Bible says that my heart is deceitfully wicked. Who can know it? If I follow my heart, I'm going to be in jail next week driving on 40. I'm just telling you, I can't follow my heart. My heart wants to do no, I can't. But this, our, if we're not careful, our society is this follow our heart society. And again, I, I, I'm just going to go there. This election season is the same way. I, I want to encourage you, and I'm not looking for tears or booze or anything. I want to encourage you to pray and vote. 
Do not set this one out. It's way too important. We, we need more Christians that are voting, and our voices need to be heard. But I want to add an addendum. Don't just pray and vote. We need to pray and we need to vote. But here's what I want you to do. I want you to align yourselves with God's word and God's spirit, feelings aside. So here's what I want to encourage you to do. I, I want you to pick up your voter registration guide. I want you to pick up your voter registration guide, and I want you to prayerfully look at your voter registration guide, pray that God's spirit leads, and align yourself with the right choices that you should make. My my voter registration guide says that abortion, killing babies, is wrong. And friend, listen, that's going to affect my vote, because that's what the voter registration guide says, that abortion is wrong. My voter registration guys tells me that promoting gender transitions for children is an attack on the image of God, and it's going to affect my vote. It's going to affect my vote. It, it, this is true. Well, Grant, you shouldn't be getting political. I knew it was just a matter of time. I loved this church, and I knew it was coming. Friend, I heard a friend preach this last Sunday. Here's what he said. The church isn't getting more political. Politics are getting more theological. He said this. When the government moved past things like building roads, and issuing driver's license to redefining marriage, erasing gender, reaffirming abortion as productive rights, and indoctrinating kids into believing those things, the church didn't move, politics did. And so church family, I just want to encourage you as believers that we need to set our feelings aside, our traditions aside, our allegiances to parties aside, and with the best of our ability, vote according to what God's word says. And I'm just going to tell you that shouldn't be hard. Pastor Josh Howerton said this, personalities come and go, but policies last a long time. Policies last a long time. All right, back in Acts. I'm done that rabbit trail. Peter, Peter has all the traditions. He's got all the personal feelings of how he was raised and the pressures around him. And yet, what did he do? Following the Lord's leading, the Spirit's leading, he remembers God's word and aligns himself with it. And then what happened? God moved in a powerful way. People put their faith and trust in Christ, and the gospel is going to move to the Gentiles. Number three, is your yes on the table? Lastly, I got to close. Is your yes on the table? The book of Acts is a movement book. We've seen it, and we'll continue to see it. It's a book about God's people saying yes. God's people saying yes. Friend, there's your yes on the table. God, what do you have for me? What do you want from me? My yes is on the table. God desires that from you, and he desires that from me. And listen, a relationship with the Lord starts with a yes, but that's not the only yes. It continues with yes after yes after yes. Have you ever put your faith and trust in the Lord as your personal Savior? The Bible says in John chapter 3, verse 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. The God of the universe is what we've been talking about in Acts. So loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Friends, God offers you the gift of salvation today if you'll receive it by faith. The Bible says, and it's clear, all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Every one of us in this room have this one thing in common today. We have all sinned and we've all fallen short. No one in this room is perfect. The Bible says we're born with what's called a sin nature. We're born with it. The Bible says the wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. The gospel and the book of Acts is about these regular men and women taking the message that God loves you, sees you, knows you, will save you today to an entire world. And it's why we're here today. The gift of salvation offered to all who will put their faith and trust in him. I'm preaching the same message that Peter did. Repent and trust Christ as your savior. And maybe you're here and you're like, well, man, Grant, I gotta get some stuff together. I gotta get some stuff figured out. Then I'm gonna come to him. You know, the Bible speaks of that in Romans 5. It says God demonstrated his own love towards us. God showed his own love towards you and me in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. And friend, God's not waiting for you to get your act together to come to him. He sees you right where you are today. And he offers you salvation if you'll put your faith and your trust in him. Man, what are you waiting for? 
For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten, his one and only son, that whoever believes in him, has faith in him, should not perish, but have everlasting life. Have you said yes to Jesus, friend? And today could be that day. Would you bow your heads in prayer? Father, just use this short time of invitation. Lord, I thank you for the simplicity of the gospel message. I thank you for your spirits leading even in this place. God, move even now. With every head bowed, every eye closed, no one looking around. Friend, if you were to die today, do you know heaven would be your home? God offers you salvation today if you'll put your faith and trust in him. What that means is you say, man, I believe that Jesus died on the cross for my sins. And I believe he rose from the grave on the third day. I want to I repent. I want forgiveness from my sins. God, would you forgive me? My trust is in you. And if you do that today, he'll save you. If that's you, I want you to pray right where you are. If that's you this morning, you're like, man, I need that this morning. I want to say yes to Jesus today. Would you pray this prayer right in your seat, watching online? Lord Jesus, I'm a sinner and I need you. Could this be the prayer from your heart this morning? Lord Jesus, I'm a sinner and I need you. I believe you died in my place. And I want to receive you right now as my Savior. Would you make that your prayer? Jesus, I'm sorry for all my sins. Please forgive me. I believe that you alone are the Lord. And I surrender all of me to you right now. Could you make that your prayer? Jesus, I'm sorry for all my sins. Please forgive me. I believe that you alone are the Lord. And I surrender all of me to you right now. Friend, if you prayed that prayer this morning in faith, I want to encourage you, if you said that prayer online, text Jesus to 980 Eight, five. We want to send you a Bible and information about growing in your relationship with the Lord. If you made that decision in the house today, when you leave today, if you made that decision, I want to encourage you to do two things. Let someone know today. And when you leave, grab one of the bags in the back wall that say fresh start. There's a bag there that's a gift for you that we want to be a blessing to you. It's got a Bible in it. and It's got information about how you can grow in your relationship with the Lord. Father, we love you. We're thankful for your word, the power in your word. Lord, I pray you would bless guide and lead us through the power of your spirit and through the power of your word. Lord, I pray that we would string yeses together. Whatever you want, for as long as you want, God, we're yours. We love you, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen.